today's topic, we're going to be looking at environmental systems. In essence, what we're going to do is introduce three of the fundamental natural sciences involved in environmental science. We're going to look at chemistry, we're going to look at physics, in particular thermodynamics, and then we're going to look at biology and ecology. The fourth fundamental natural science, geology, we're going to look at our next topic in earth cycles. Now, I just want to say something before we begin. Um, I assume no prior knowledge to any of these subjects. So a lot of what we cover today should be a review back to your high school science days. I want to make sure everybody has the fa same fundamental foundation for this class. And so let's begin with chemistry. Chemistry is the study of matter and how matter can be transformed from one physical state or phase into another. Now, matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. That chair you're sitting on is matter. The desk you're writing on is matter. Here's the thing though, not all matter is visible. Right now, you're breathing in nitrogen and oxygen molecules. Can you see them? No, you cannot. But does it have mass? Yes, they do. And do those particles occupy a space? Yes, they do. So chemistry is essentially the study of matter. Not all that matter is visible in the universe. Now, we're going to talk about the three basic physical states or phases. We're not going to talk about plasma, which is often called the fourth state. We're going to stick to the basic three, solids, liquids, and gases. Now, a solid is matter that has a constant volume and a constant shape. For example, the desk you're sitting at always occupies the same amount of volume and it always looks the same unless you exert a force on it. For example, if you were to say take a sledgehammer and start beating on your desk, the volume and shape would change. But unless an external force is applied, solids, constant volume, constant shape. A liquid is matter that has a constant volume but has an indefinite shape. That word indefinite means that a liquid will assume the shape of whatever its container is. I have a glass of water sitting right next to me. I have a constant volume of water in that glass, but if I were to say tip the glass, the water would spill out and its shape would change. So constant volume, but indefinite shape. And a gas has an indefinite volume and an indefinite shape. It will both assume both the size and shape of its container. So gases can expand or contract to fit into both size and shape. So indefinite volume, indefinite shape. So chemistry is essentially how we can take a solid and make a gas, or take a gas and make a liquid. Now, let's take water, because water is the only substance that exists naturally in all three phases. And what we do here is we have them in this picture. Here we have solid ice, and if you look at it from a microscopic or an atomic level, you'll notice the solid has a very orderly, structured pattern to it. That's what gives it constant volume, constant shape. Now, if we take liquid water and we look at it on an atomic level, you'll notice some of that structure is lost. It's more chaotic, more random. And so constant volume, but indefinite shape. And finally, our gaseous water. This is the most chaotic or random of all of them. So that structure is completely gone. Indefinite volume, indefinite shape. Now, when we talk about converting from one phase into another, that process is always going to involve the transfer of energy, usually in the form of heat. And there's two types of reactions. We have an endothermic reaction in which absorbs heat, and exothermic reactions release heat. And let's take water, once again, because it exists 
in all three phases. Ice, and we were to melt it to create liquid water. Think about it. If you're melting ice, are you absorbing heat or releasing heat? You're absorbing it. So this direction, from solid to a liquid to a gas, these red arrows are endothermic reactions. If, on the other hand, we started with uh, gaseous water, we condensed it to a liquid and then froze it to a solid, these would be exothermic reactions. So in this direction, we're absorbing heat. In this direction, we're releasing heat. Now, we talked about looking at water on a microscopic or an atomic level. Let's define what an atom is. An atom, which is the basic building block of blocks of all matter in the universe, is the smallest component of an element having that element's chemical properties. And we'll talk about what an element is here in a second. Now, atoms are composed of subatomic particles, and there's three kinds. We have protons, which are positively charged, we have electrons, which are negatively charged, and we have neutrons, which have no charge. They're neutral. Now, if we look at the structure of an atom, um, I'm, pr I'm guessing you've probably seen some kind of picture like this in your past, where the center region of an atom is called the nucleus, and that's what contains the neutrons and protons. This is where most of the mass of an atom resides. Everything outside of the nucleus is empty space. And within that empty space, we have our electrons. Now, as this picture depicts, um, we've often thought of these electrons as orbiting around the nucleus the same way that planets orbit around the sun. That is technically not 100% accurate. What we have instead are what are called electron shells. Think of these as energy levels. So we have shells close to the nucleus, and we have these shells farther away from the nucleus. These are where the electrons reside, and they can jump up or jump down to different um, valence or energy levels. Now, these electrons are going to be important for us when we talk about something later on called chemical bonding. Now, since an atom is uh, the basic building block of matter uh, or smallest component of an element that retains that element's uh, properties, we need to talk about what an element is. A pure chemical substance that consists of one type of atom that makes up all matter. And we have our periodic table of the elements. And what what they've done is they've grouped similar elements together. And so everything that you see on the left-hand side in the blue, those are what are called metals. The elements that you see in the light green, these are non-metals. And the red elements in between are called semi-metals. They have some properties of metals, some properties of non-metals. The last dark green column that you see there is a very important group called our noble gases. Now let's talk about these different groups on our periodic table and let's start with our metals. So once again these elements on the left hand side in blue. These are typically solids at room temperature and they're really good to great conductors of both heat and electricity. They also have a proper property called malleability which means they can be molded into different geometric shapes, which makes some of them, like gold and silver, particularly useful in designing jewelry. The nonmetals, the ones on the right-hand side in the light green, these are poor conductors of heat and electricity, and they can be either solids, liquids, or gases at room temperatures. And then our semi-metals, also called metalloids, those were the red elements. They have intermediate properties between the two end members. So they have some properties of metals, other properties of nonmetals. They're kind of a mix uh, in between. Now, let's talk about chemical bonding. 
And a chemical bond is a force of attraction of different elements. Elements can actually bond with other elements through these chemical bonds. And there's three types. We have ionic bonds, which are when electrons are transferred. So something loses electrons, something gains electrons. We have metallic bonds, and we have covalent bonds in which electrons are shared. Now I'm going to go into detail in all three, but I at least wanted to introduce the, the two main types, ionic and covalent, now. So sodium and chlorine can bond together in an ionic bond. In this case, they start off as um, neutral. So the sodium and the chlorine have no charge. Now in this case, the sodium has an extra electron that it doesn't want. So it loses that electron and becomes now positively charged. It becomes Na1+. The chlorine accepts the extra electron and it, that started off neutral, becomes Cl1-. Now I want to point out these here. If you remember high school chemistry class, if you remember the octet rule, every element wants to have eight elements in its valence electron shells. And by losing that one electron, now sodium is happy as one plus, and the chlorine, which is now one minus, is now also happy because it has eight electrons in its valence shell. So when we think about chemical bonds, particularly ionic bonds, it's all about making an element happy by getting the, those eight elements in its outer valence electron shell. Now in covalent bond, here's water, which forms through a covalent bond. The hydrogen brings one electron to the table. The oxygen brings one electron to the table. So when they bond, they share this pair of electrons. So the hydrogen and the oxygen share it. The other hydrogen brings one electron to the table. The oxygen brings one electron to the table. And so they share that pair of electrons. That's covalent bonds. Now, let's go into a lot more detail in each of the three types, and let's start with ionic bonds. Once again, these are formed through a transfer of electrons. Something has to lose electrons, something has to gain electrons. Now, when we do that, we create something called ions. These are elements that have a net charge. Cations, these are positively charged elements. They're the ones that lose the electrons. And we have anions. These are negatively charged elements. They're the ones that gain electrons. In an ionic bond, you are going to create one cation and one anion. Always. You'll never have two cations. You'll never have two anions. Because something has to lose and something has to gain. Now, let's go back to uh, another example. Let's take sodium um, bonding with fluorine. So once again, sodium starts off as neutral. And notice, it has the same amount of protons than electrons. So 11 protons, 11 electrons, no charge, neutral. Now, it loses that one electron. Its octet is now happy because that outer valence shell is filled. But now since it lost the one electron, it still has the 11 protons but now it only has 10 electrons, which gives it a one plus charge. So whenever you're looking at ionic bonds, you need to keep track of who gains or loses the electron because that is what will affect the charge. Now the fluorine starts off with nine protons, nine electrons, no charge. But it's unhappy because it only has seven electrons in its valence shell, so it now gains that new one. It becomes one minus. Now it has nine protons still, but it has 10 electrons. So when you're looking at the charge, when you're looking at ions, it's simply um, a comparison of how many protons to how many electrons. If you have more protons than electrons, it's positively charged. If you have more electrons than protons, it's negatively charged. And if they're equal, like we started out in both of these cases, there is no charge. They're formed when 
electrons are shared. This is methane, one of the most commonly burned natural gases for energy. It's CH4. And so the carbon brings one electron to the table. The hydrogen brings one electron to the table. And so you're sharing that pair of electrons. So we have one, two, three, four covalent bonds in methane. Now, anything that is held together by covalent bonds is called a molecule. So ions are created through ionic bonds. Molecules are created through covalent bonds. Now, let's do another example of fluorine bonding to itself. We're going to talk more about this in our Earth cycles. This is called diatomic, when something bonds to itself. In this case, once again, the first fluorine lacks that one electron. The second fluorine lacks that one electron. So they bond and they share that pair of electrons. They're, not, they're now happy because their octet rule is filled with for both um, fluorine, um, both fluorines. Lastly, we have our metallic bonds. Now, in our metals, the outer electrons in the outer valence shells are very weakly held together. And so they're very easily dislodged. When they're dislodged, we're going to create those excess electrons and then positively charged metallic ions because they're the ones that lose that electrons. Now, what happens is we're going to have kind of, you can think of it as like a soup where we have these dislodged electrons in with these positively charged metallic ions. And as the electrons come close to these positively charged metallic ions, we form these weak bonds between the electrons and the positively charged um, metallic ions. That is what is called a metallic bond. So it's a bond between a dislodged electron and the positively charged metallic ions. The, those bonds are what give metals their great ability to conduct both heat and electricity and their malleability. So here's what happens. So once again, think of this as, as a soup where we've had all these metals and their electrons have been dislodged. And so as these electrons approach these positively charged um, ions, we get this bond of attraction. And that's all a chemical bond is, a force of attraction. These weak bonds give metals their characteristics. Now the last thing I want to talk about before we leave chemistry is something called the pH scale. This is a numeric scale that runs from 0 to 14 that expresses how acidic or basic a solution is. You can see the equation there that pH is equal to minus the log of the hydronium ion, the H plus ion. Now, if you have a pH exactly equal to 7, this is what we call a neutral solution. It's neither acidic nor basic. It's in between. Now, if you have anything that's less than 7, from 0 all the way up to 7, this is an acidic solution. If you have a pH of like 5 or 6, this would be called weakly acidic solutions, like urine or carbonated uh, caffeine, uh, carbonated water or a soda. If you have a pH that's like 0, this would be a strong acid, battery acid, hyd hydrofluoric acid. If you have a solution that has a pH greater than 7, you are called a basic solution. Now you can be weakly basic, like seawater, or you can be strongly basic, like a pH of 14, like liquid drain clean. Now the reason I bring this up now is because we're going to talk about acidity and pH when we get to climate change. And we're going to talk about a process called ocean acidification which is the gradual lowering of pH of ocean water due to um, the dissolution of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, that's the end of our chemistry discussion. And so 
we're going to talk about alchemical bonds are, are periodically going to come up. And so now we want to move on to physics. And really in physics, it's about a branch that deals with energy. And so I need to introduce some vocabulary words. In fact, today's topic is really all about the vocabulary. I have to introduce quite a lot of vocab words so that you can understand concepts later on. And so let's define energy. Energy is the capacity or ability to do work. There are two main types that we're going to talk about in a couple minutes. Potential energy versus kinetic energy. Now if energy is the capacity or ability to do work, well what's work? Work is done when a force is applied to an object and that object moves a given distance in the direction of the force. Now you can do a little experiment at home. Take your pen or pencil that you're writing with and with one finger slowly push it across the desk. You are performing work right now. That pen or pencil is moving a given distance in the direction that you're pushing it. That's work. Now if work is done when a force is applied, we need to now define what a force is. And a force is any influence that causes an object to undergo a certain change. That change can be in its movement, in its direction, or in its shape. Now, the example I used earlier on. Let's say that you start taking a sledgehammer to your desk. Start pounding on your desk with a sledgehammer. You are exerting a force that would then cause the shape of that desk to change. Now let me give you another example. For those of you that are football fans, whether you watch college football on Saturdays or NFL football on Sundays, think about this example. We have a ball carrier and we have a linebacker. The ball carrier is running to the line of scrimmage. The linebacker is moving to meet them. As soon as those two players hit each other, they have both exerted a force on the other that will cause both of them to change their movement and their direction. Either the ball carrier will run over the linebacker or the linebacker will completely stop the running back or maybe you get kind of a mixture of something in between. That's a force, an influence that causes an object to undergo a change. Now let's talk about the two types of energy. Potential energy is energy that is stored in an object as the result of its vertical position or height. Usually when we're talking about potential energy we have to define a datum or some point where the potential energy is going to be equal to zero. Most cases we define ground surface as the, the point where potential energy is equal to zero. And so anything that is above the ground surface has potential energy because it has the potential to be in motion. If an object is sitting on the ground surface, it has no potential energy. Now, when I think about this, this is what I like to ask myself. Can that object fall? If the answer to that question is yes, it has potential energy. So let's say you're holding a tennis ball above ground surface. Ask yourself, can that tennis ball fall? The answer is yes. So it has potential energy. Now the other type of energy is kinetic energy. This is the energy of motion. Anything that's moving has kinetic energy. Now we can take kinetic energy and convert it into potential and vice versa. Take potential energy and convert it into kinetic. And let me give you an example of that. Let's say that we are riding our bicycle up in the Rocky Mountains. As you make your way up the first mountain, you have both forms. You're moving, so you have kinetic energy. And you can fall, right? You're in the mountain. So you can fall, which means that you have potential. So you have both potential and kinetic. Now, you reach the top of the first mountain, and there's a split second where all of your motion ceases. At that particular point, you have 100% potential energy, 0% kinetic energy. All of your energy is in potential because your motion is stopped. 
the mountain and that potential energy is converted into kinetic. Direction doesn't matter whether you're, you're riding up or down, you would have both forms here. Now, we, we're out of the Rocky Mountains now and we're going to make an assumption that this rider can't fall off his bike. So we're going to assume this is a single object. Now, he's out of the mountains, the rider can't fall off the bicycle, you're at ground level, do you have potential energy? No. Your potential energy is 0% while your kinetic is 100%. So here's an example of how one form can be converted into another. Uh, we can also look at a roller coaster. Okay, Think about it. As you move up that first hill slowly, you have both kinetic energy, you're moving, and you have potential. You can fall out. You reach the top of that first hill, and there's a split second where your motion ceases. All of your energy is potential. You then go down the first hill, start screaming like a little girl, and you have both potential and kinetic energy. Eventually, as you um, move into the end of the ride, you're at ground level. We're going to assume that you can't fall out of the car. All of your energy is kinetic energy. All right, let's move on and talk about temperature. Now, this is often difficult for a lot of introductory students because when you think of temperature, you think of how hot or cold something is. That is not scientifically accurate. What temperature is, is the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a substance. So it's a not a measurement of how hot or cold something is, it's a measurement of kinetic energy. Now. Let's take two examples here. Let's say that I have two boxes, as shown uh, below. And the boxes have air in them, so they have oxygen and nitrogen molecules. This first box here, I stick into a freezer. Now those molecules were moving around. As soon as I put it into a freezer, what's going to happen to the nitrogen and oxygen molecules? They're going to slow down. Not stop, but slow down. Why? Because their kinetic energy has decreased because their temperature has decreased. Now, this second box right here, let's say we stick that in an oven and we turn the oven on. So those particles that were moving, as soon as the oven warms up, those particles are going to move even quicker than they were before. So they're going to speed up because their kinetic energy has increased because their temperature has increased. So I know this is often difficult for introductory students because you're simply used to thinking about temperature, how hot or cold something is. It's not. It's how much kinetic energy something has. At low temperatures, low kinetic energy. High temperatures, high kinetic energy. Now, let's talk about heat. This is the energy transfer from one body to another. And we can measure this through heat capacity, which is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of any substance by one degree Celsius. Now the reason I bring this up is because there are certain substances that have a low heat capacity, where you have to add just a little bit of energy to increase its temperature. There are other substances that have a very high heat capacity, that it requires an enormous amount of energy to raise its temperature. Let me give you examples of both. Think of something that has a low heat capacity, which means it requires just a little bit of energy to change its temperature. Metals have very low heat capacity. Why do we cook with metals, with stainless steel, with copper? Because of their low heat capacity. They heat up quickly. Water, on the other hand, is something that has a very high heat capacity. It requires an enormous amount of energy to change water's temperature. Now, you probably never thought about this, but let's do this example. Let's say that you're, you're swimming in San Diego, swimming in the Pacific Ocean, and you decide to swim in January and in July. Okay, Is the temperature of the ocean water different from January to July. The fact is that it's not. It's the air temperature that's different and often while swimming than in July. 
but the ocean itself the temperature doesn't change because of water's high heat capacity now when we talk about um, the energy transfer let me give you examples okay think about this let's say that you want to go running during a hot day in August in Las Vegas and as soon as you start running your body instantly begins to sweat why why does your body sweat because it's trying to release energy to its surroundings in order to cool it off in that case that would be an exothermic reaction where you're trying to release heat from your body to the surrounding atmosphere on the other hand let's say it's a cold January day and you go outside without a coat and you instantly begin to shiver why does your body shiver because it's trying to absorb heat from its surroundings an endothermic reaction this is what heat is transfer from one body to another now there's two different types of heat there is what is called sensible heat this is heat that can be measured using a thermometer so whatever today's high temperature is that's sensible heat your body is that I always forget if it's 98.6 or 98.8 I think it's 98.6 that's sensible heat heat that can be measured using a thermometer but there's also latent heat heat absorbed in an endothermic or released in an exothermic during a phase change without a change in temperature now let's go back to using water as our example so we have solid liquid and gaseous water from negative 40 to 0 this is all sensible heat heat measured using a thermometer now as soon as we reach 0 we have to transform this solid into a liquid and so this portion here notice that the temperature isn't changing but it's the amount of heat that we have to absorb to melt the ice to make liquid water this is latent heat right here now from 0 to 100 this is sensible heat again and then once we hit 100 notice the temperature doesn't change but this is the heat that has to be absorbed during a phase change to change the liquid into gaseous water notice that it requires a lot less energy to melt ice than it does to turn liquid water into gaseous water so all along this point is latent and then 100 plus this is sensible so in this graph this this and this sensible heat this area here and this area here is latent heat the energy that is required to change phase now when we talk about heat transfer there's a couple other processes we want to discuss the first one being conduction we've actually talked about this a little bit this is the movement of heat in an object due to a temperature gradient in the case of conduction the heat flows from a region of high temperature to a region of low temperature and the example that's in that picture is think about let's say that you have a metal rod and you stick it into a fire so to begin with the metal rod was one temperature it was cold as soon as you stick it into a fire the end that's in the fire is going to heat up and so what conduction is is the slow movement of heat up the metal rod from an area of high temperature to an area of low temperature ultimately if you remain holding on to the metal rod the heat will eventually move all the way up and burn your hand this is conduction and remember metals are great conductors not only of heat but also of electricity the other process we want to talk about is something called convection and I want you to star this in your note because we're going to talk about convection a lot there are convective cells in our atmosphere in our oceans even within the earth itself and so convection is if you heat an air or a fluid it expands becomes less dense and it rises on the other hand if you cool air or a fluid it contracts becomes more dense and sinks back down so hot air or a fluid rises cold air or a fluid sinks because of density differences the hot materials rise the cold materials sink 
because they're more dense. You may have heard of this if you've ever heard of a convective oven. Well, this is how they cook the food, the continual motion of heat. Now, I'm going to stop here. This is going to be the first half of our discussion. Uh, we will pick this up um, the second half of this discussion.